Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan from A Better Question, and in this video I'm asking why we call computer viruses viruses. Whether famous hacker Kevin Mitnick ended up in solitary because there was a rumor he could start World War III from a telephone, or if it was because he was hoarding tuna. And finally, a few where are they nows for those celebrity hackers of yesteryear. Having just lived through 2020, it's probably safe to say that most people out there have at least some understanding of how a virus works. Invading from outside the system, it hijacks system resources in order to replicate itself and spread to yet more systems. Computer or biological, that's how a virus do. So when we're talking about self-replicating programs that come from outside the system to hijack system resources to replicate themselves, you might be thinking, well, that's why we call it a computer virus. It just makes too much sense to call it anything else. To which my rebuttal would be, so? There's a thing called explanation bias. It's the human tendency to think that just because something did happen a certain way, that it had to happen that way, or that it should have happened that way. When we find an explanation that makes sense, our brain turns it from a plausible explanation to the thing that happened. This bias works closely with a few others that show up often in history books, witness testimony, and frankly our own memories. So yes, the name computer virus makes a lot of sense. But contrapoint, here's a bunch of tape. The names of most of these make a lot of sense. Then there's this guy. We call Scotch Tape Scotch Tape because its inventor was told, quote, not to be so scotch with the adhesive by someone testing the product during its development, who apparently didn't think the tape was sticky enough. The word scotch has had a lot of different meanings over the years, it still kind of does, but at the time it was also a derogatory term for Scottish people. It was a shorthand way to call someone cheap, stingy, or a penny pincher. But the inventor of scotch tape wasn't Scottish. The person testing the product who made this comment wasn't Scottish. The company that makes the tape is from Minnesota, not Scotland. So in this context, the word scotch was meant to insultingly compare something to a negative stereotype about an entire group of people. You know, just like how racism works. Nevertheless, here we are. Ah, look at it, it even has a little plaid on it. People are perfectly willing to accept a nonsense label for a thing, and then use it forever. You can Google hundreds of examples of this, including Google and hacking. So computer viruses could just as easily have been named after some programmer's favorite poodle or something. And you wouldn't even think twice about the monthly email that you got from IT reminding you to update your anti-Duncan software. Okay, reeling it in a bit. The first programs that we'd call computer viruses weren't called computer viruses. Bob Thomas wrote the first one in 1971. It was just known as Creeper. It was spread on ARPANET, which is like the internet's great-great-great-grandparent. This little bugger made a message display on the infected computer that read, I'm the Creeper, catch me if you can. Soon thereafter, the first antivirus software showed up. It was called Reaper, and it was written solely to eradicate Creeper. Compared to today's malware, this virus was basically the equivalent of some distant evolutionary ancestor of ours that first flopped its way out of the ocean to take a big gulp of air. The idea of self-replicating programs dates back to 1949 and John von Neumann, but academics didn't compare these programs to viruses until the 1980s. The first paper to use the term computer virus was written by Fred Cohen in 1984. Science fiction, on the other hand, had named the thing almost before it was a reality. A short story by Gregory Benford called The Scarred Man was published in 1970, and it mentions a self-replicating computer program called V-I-R-U-S. But probably the most influential voice that took a biological perspective and applied it to computer software comes from Harvard Medical School dropout Michael Crichton. The first novel he published under his own name was about a biological organism run amok. It was a huge hit. His second project was a film called Westworld. It was also a critical success, and it directly compared the software that was causing androids to malfunction to a biological infectious disease. He later created the show ER, so he's also responsible for George Clooney. So science provided the theory, and then art dressed it up and gave it back. And computer virus became the term that we use to refer to any bad computer software. 30 years later, we're a bit more specific. Computer viruses are just one kind of bad computer software. And all bad software is grouped under one term, malware. I had to leave out a lot of the details when I talked about some of the celebrity hackers in hacker history. But there was a pioneering phone freaker that I didn't get to talk about at all. And he approached the subject in a very unique way. This is Joy Bubbles. 
That's the actual legal name that he chose, so that's the one I'm going to use. Joy Bubbles was born blind in 1949, but he also had the ability to replicate any musical note by name without playing a reference tone first, often called perfect pitch. He was obviously a real smart dude. At five years old, he figured out that he could dial phone numbers by tapping the hang-up switch instead of by using the number dial. By seven, he accidentally discovered that he could control phones by whistling at a certain pitch. Joy Bubbles understood phones in a way that more closely resembles how phones understand phones. These are machines that relay and are controlled by sound. In college, he got the nickname Whistler because he never bothered with a keypad to dial a phone number. He just whistled into the phone to make a call. He was the human version of a freaker box, and fellow students in the know could give Joy Bubbles one dollar and a phone number, and he would whistle them up a toll-free long-distance call. It was Joy Bubbles who told John Draper about the whistle in the cereal box, allowing John Draper to become Captain Crunch. Joy Bubbles continued phone freaking after college and through the 1960s, until 1968 when a Bell Telephone Company employee illegally tapped his phone and gave a bunch of evidence over to the FBI. Joy Bubbles got his house raided and was convicted of malicious mischief, which is actually the same crime that you would be charged with for vandalizing something, because this is the late 1960s and nobody knew what to call this yet. But that run-in with the law was enough to convince Joy Bubbles to give up phone freaking entirely. Later in life, he went on to start his own church, the Church of Eternal Childhood, and changed his name to Joy Bubbles. This guy is actually pretty amazing. You should go check out some of the links for more information below. His biography reads like a roller coaster of creative accomplishments mixed with horrifying trauma and adversity. Basically, the universe did zero favors for this guy, and yet he seemed to constantly try to make the world a better place for everyone. Kevin Mitnick, on the other hand, is a totally different beast. He's the self-proclaimed most famous hacker ever, which at the time was probably true. Kevin Mitnick is the guy who said he was in solitary because a prosecutor convinced a judge that he could launch nuclear weapons by calling up NORAD on the jail payphone. I'm not sure why they just didn't, you know, not let him use the payphone. Then again, he also said that the myth of Kevin Mitnick is much more interesting than the actual facts of his life. Mitnick was a technically competent hacker to be sure, but he's mostly known as the hacker who could dupe people just as easily as any computer system. He was like a social engineer or a human hacker, or if we're honest, a con man. So maybe that's the reason that his story about nuclear weapons and solitary confinement smells a bit fishy. It's not the only reason though. I did find evidence that he actually was in solitary, but only on a temporary basis for disciplinary reasons. According to his lawyer, Mitnick was sent to solitary for hoarding more than 70 cans of tuna, which according to the article was something that he'd already been warned not to do. If this really happened, it also seems like something that he did because it would make a good headline, or just because he was bored. It also might not be the real reason that he was sent to solitary, and Mitnick had a very accommodating lawyer. Either way, Mitnick was eventually released from prison. He went on to write a bunch of best-selling books about hacking and social manipulation. And now he runs an internet security company, because of course he does. Then there's Kevin Paulson. He's the guy who won a Porsche 944 from a radio contest that he rigged. All of which he did while eluding the FBI for more than a year. While on the lam, he was profiled by Unsolved Mysteries, which then had its call-in tip line crash during the episode. The Porsche story is kind of the tip of the Paulsonberg. Paulson rigged other phone call-in contests, he wiretapped anyone he wanted to, including a famous actress and an ex, and he stole secret documents from the defense contractor that he worked for. He was actually the first hacker to be charged with espionage, and he ended up serving five years in a federal penitentiary. After his release, Paulson rebranded himself as a journalist. He reported on computer security stories and utilized his information gathering skills to eventually become a senior editor at Wired. At one point, he uncovered hundreds of sex offenders who were using the internet to target children. He was the one to break the Chelsea Manning leak story, and he's now a contributing writer at the Daily Beast, where he's done quite a bit to combat disinformation and fake news stories spread on social media. So, good on ya. Speaking of fake news, propaganda, and the lying liars that lie, right now I'm researching the next segment of the Hacker History series. It turns out this involves trying to identify just how responsible Russia is for the paranoid delusions that control half the internet. And possibly relatedly, it involves trying to find out where QAnon came from. I'm still double-checking sources and turning a ton of data into conclusions into a script. So thank you for being patient. In the meantime, please consider subscribing if you like my content, and if you really like a particular video, please share it somewhere. This channel owes everything it is to you, the viewers. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. After some programmer's favorite poodle or something.
like every three minutes. God damn, dude. Nah, I just gotta wipe my whistle. Just wipe your asshole? A whistle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> whistle, whist, whistle, whistly. <laughs>